Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Sci-Files, an impact exposure series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. This summer, our theme is focusing on the relationship between graduate student mentors and their undergraduate student mentees. Mentoring is an important part of research and helps students develop into the scientists of today. Today is a really exciting day. We have a very full studio. We have Greg, Emma, Mary, and Vanessa over here. May you please introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Greg Landis. I'm a junior chemical engineering student. Hi, I'm Emma Davis, and I'm a junior environmental engineering student. Hello, I'm Vanessa, and I'm a second year PhD student in chemical engineering. Hi, my name is Mary Ench, and I'm a third year PhD student in chemical engineering. And we are all here to talk about our research with perfluoral alkyl substance remediation using electrochemical oxidation. Well, that was a mouthful. Could you explain a little bit about what that means, Mary? Yeah, so perfluoral alkyl substances are man-made compounds that were used in industry, um, such as firefighting foams, Teflon pans, or water-resistant clothing. So they're actually persistent in the environment, and they don't degrade. And what we found is that they have toxic health effects towards humans. So we are working to clean them up out of our groundwater, wastewater, landfill leachates, and a bunch of different aqueous solutions. Interesting. So what I'm gathering from it is that it's something that repels water? Yeah, so rain-resistant clothing or shoes or sprays that you would put on your shoes or a rain jacket would have these compounds in it. Or like your Teflon pans is made of perfluoral alkyl substances, so that's what repels the oil and grease and stuff on pans. In the news, I've heard it being pronounced PFAS as well as PFAs. Is there a correct way to actually say the acronym? So it depends on the person, but the acronym is PFAS, so some people do spell it out, and some people just say PFAS, so it's one word. Um, And that is the overarching term of all the compounds, so there's thousands of these compounds under that main umbrella term. What are the main problems that scientists are finding with PFAS? Is it like a developmental uh, problems that end up occurring with people who drink like the water? Or am I maybe thinking of like BPA instead? So we don't know all the toxic effects of PFAS yet because there's so many compounds. But two of the main compounds, PFOA and PFOS, um, cause birth defects. So if pregnant women are exposed and they can also lead to certain forms of cancer. Vana, can you tell us a little bit about what your contributions are towards this particular project? Right. So currently we're working uh, with PFAS remediation in landfill leachates because uh, leachates seem to be one of the main sources in which uh, PFAS are being released at the end. So a lot of cities are worried about uh, having remediation technologies to treat PFAS in leachates because certainly there is no other way, they, they haven't been discovered any other way to treat them um, currently. And certainly they are, there are different other technologies that have been able to absorb PFAS, but at the end, all these technologies finish in either incineration or they bury the, the leachets, uh, which is not an ideal solution. So basically what we're doing is destroying the PFAS is not just about accumulating them and then incinerating them. All right, then what I'm actually really not familiar with what a leachate is. Could you clarify about that? Right. So basically a leachate is the liquid that you get when you mix the waste or the trash. When you have your waste, you have organics in there and you mix all the garbage, including, you know, plastics and whatever. And so all this trash goes to a landfill. And after some time, uh, this garbage will release a liquid. And this liquid is called the leachate. So, yeah, so usually leachates are treated with different methods at, at the moment, like reverse osmosis, for example, which is one of the most common methods to treat leachates. But one of the drawbacks of these technologies is that you cannot actually get rid of PFAS. You're basically just accumulating them and then, I don't know, probably incinerating them, but you're not destroying them. It sounds like it's very similar to the problem we have with nuclear waste and what to deal with it, actually. Right. It it just sits somewhere. We don't know how to actually get rid of it. 
Exactly, and that's the same case what is going on now with PFAS. There is not actually one technology that can destroy them. And in that sense, electrooxidation is a solution because electrooxidation breaks down the molecules of PFAS. So we oxidize them until you reach mi- mineralization. It sounds pretty difficult. Kind of <laughs> challenging. <laughs> This water sounds like it smells really bad. Do you go into the field and get the samples of it, or is this provided to you? Well, fortunately, it is provided to us, like in big jugs. So we receive a big jug uh, once every two weeks or so, and then, of course, we have to filter them and then treat them, but it's very nasty. It has a very bad smell, and, yeah, you know, leeches. (laughs) We always open them in a fume hood. So you don't have to smell it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What is the biological hazards with PFAS in the first place? Because I've read them so much in the news, I don't uh, entirely understand what it does to the human body. Or is it a chemical hazard instead? Um, So basically what PFAS does is because the same thing it does in water, um, it just kind of stays in your blood and in other uh, internal organs. Um, It just stabilizes there. It never exits the body. So once you have a higher concentration of them in your body, it's going to start to mutate your cells. Um, So it kind of does have both a biological and a chemical effect to your body. Thanks for that, Emma. It kind of reminds me of microplastics. Like, is it related to microplastics? Because, like, people say how that accumulates in your body and then they don't know how to break that down, especially, like, when you eat it. Like, are people even eating PFAS? Um, So actually, as of recently, the FDA has been finding PFAS trace amounts in a lot of foods, like packaged chocolate cake. They've found potentially a hazard for that um, in some brands, um, which is crazy. And another crazy thing, too, is you cannot find blood anymore that doesn't have trace amounts of PFAS in it. Um, They're having to go back to the 50s and 60s, those blood samples, to find clean blood. I think that it's just in everything at this point, and there's not really a lot of um, places where you can't find any trace amounts. Thanks, Emma. And could you clarify a little bit about what your involvement with this project is? Um, so actually, me and Greg started our freshman year for semester. Um, we went into Fraunhofer through the professorial assistantship program, um, so we um, we're paired with our boss, um, who is all of our bosses, uh, Corey Rusnick, um, and he's a scientist at Fraunhofer, and he does a lot of um, electrochemical applications. Um, so he kind of taught us, um, you know, all of the electrochemical measurements. Um, he gave us a good background. And then um, my second semester, I started working with Mary with PFAS. Um, we just did some trial runs initially, just degrading them um, with a set concentration, Um, nothing pilot scale, just lab scale. Um, So this is really exciting because this is the first time in a few, for the first few weeks of my summer, um, we've been able to do pilot scale testing, um, which is really cool. What do you mean by pilot scale testing? So um, lab scale means that you're making synthetic solutions yourself. Um, You're starting off with um, calculating concentrations of what you need and making the solutions and testing those. Um, But for the landfill leachates, those are concentrations that we don't know. Um, So once we get all of our results back, we'll be able to have a good idea of what we're tackling because leachates are so, um, they fluctuate so much depending on rainfall, um, depending on what wastes you're putting in there. Each of our samples is so different. So um, in order to figure out a good solution for all general leachates, um, we have to do pilot testing um, for a while. Great. And you had mentioned that both you and Greg started in the Fraunhofer lab at the same time. Greg, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you've been involved with the lab and what's your research based on? Well, when I first started two years ago, we had several different projects that we were working on uh, using different electrochemical technology. And 
but uh, essentially what I've been doing with this stage of our PFAS project has been taking the samples that Vanessa and Mary have been doing their studies on and analyzing the results from their tests. So basically, I would go through the samples and measure different uh, and just do different measurements to actually see what is going on in the solutions, what kind of stuff we have in there, and kind of quantifying that. Uh, specifically, I've been measuring a lot of the chemical oxygen demand, which is kind of an indirect way of measuring the organic compounds and quantifying what we all have in there, as well as I've been doing a lot of ion chromatography, which is a way of specifically measuring the concentrations of different ions, which specifically we've been focusing on fluoride, chloride, chlorate, and perchlorate, um, as chloride is pos probably by far the ho most highly concentrated ion that we see in these solutions. So, Emma and Greg, are any of these projects that you're working on contributing towards Mary's or Vane's thesis by any chance? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, we're working right under them, so we're helping them out with whatever they need help with, um, which is really rewarding for us because we get to learn something we're not learning inside of the classroom. Um, and we get to work on a project that's like super meaningful. Um, it's helping people um, and it's helping them as well, which is really nice that we get to do that. Yeah, I agree with that. Now we're all just one team working towards one goal. So it really feels like we're really working together to hopefully come up with a solution for this PFAS problem. And I agree that's the whole what I, with what Emma just said about helping people and helping take care of the planet, which is essentially why I became an engineer in the first place, is to solve those world problems. And then finally, can both Mary and Vanna explain what their thesis project is actually going to be specifically focusing on? Okay, so my PhD thesis is going to be three different topics combined, just because I started before we got really deep into this PFAS project. So my first two chapters are both on electrochemical sensing methods. So this is either sensing a biological compound or heavy metals in aqueous solutions. And then the last part of my thesis is going to primarily focus on the PFAS remediation. And then I'm going to do PFAS in complex samples. So instead of just a simulated water solution with PFAS that we make, I'm going to take actual still bottoms, which is the leftover PFAS concentrate from a concentrating method, and then I'm going to treat those. Well, in my case, my research is focused on uh, PFAS remediation in complex matrices as well, but in landfill leachets, basically. So, well, it's a very broad topic because it entails a lot of different factors. So we are currently analyzing the feasibility of just treating directly leachates with electrooxidation, but probably we'll, we will get into other type of pretreatments for leachates specifically, such as electrocoagulation, for example, so that we can actually get rid, get rid of all the organic matter that we don't need before treating PFAS at the end. Interesting. You mentioned a lot of stuff. So, Mary, you said that you guys do biological sensors. What type of biological sensors are you looking at? So, the front of our center that we're in is the Center for Coatings and Diamond Technologies. So, all the sensing applications that we do is with boron-doped diamond. So, this is a conductive diamond film, and I use this to sense isatin, um, which is a biological compound in your body, and you can detect it through your urine and your blood. And then if you have better detection methods where we can study this compound more, ultimately they want to create a cure for Parkinson's disease or some other um, ep epilepsy is another one that isatin contributes to. And you mentioned that you want to have a more complex medium than water, but what I understood is that you called it still water, right? Still bottoms. Still bottoms. So was that like concentrated PFAS only or are you also like doing something to the water as well, like maybe making it more like blood or some other type of solution? So the concentrated still bottoms um, is from one of the adsorption techniques. So when you use ion exchange, you basically pull all the PFAS out of your normal water and adsorb them to a resin. 
and then to deadsorb them from the resin, you rinse it with a really salty brine solution that also contains alcohol. So the still bottom would be all the PFAS in the salty brine with the alcohol. So that is what I would treat for the PFAS. Now, just to clarify, between Mary's research and Vani's research, the biggest difference in regards to PFAS remediation is Mary is looking at the still bottom uh, scenario while Vani is observing and studying the leachets so portion of the PFAS problem. Correct. Right. So the reason why we're doing all this is because at the end we want to treat real solutions. So well, in my case, we are doing it now. We're treating real solutions. But in the case of Mary, she ultimately wants also to treat real solutions because, as I said, currently in the market, there are solutions available for treating PFAS. And one of the most common ones is um, concentration technology such as ion exchange, for example. But as I mentioned before, these technologies just concentrate the PFAS and at the end you have a steel bottom solution with any type of... Um, um, salt yeah, and salt. alcohol. <laughs> yeah. And so we do this, we use electrochemical oxidation after this pre-treating method because if you're just taking a solution with PFAS and the parts per trillion or parts per billion concentration level, it's not as efficient for electrochemical oxidation. But if you concentrate it first, it's more efficient for the process. I have a few questions about what you said. You had mentioned that there was like a resin that could basically attract the PFAS or that it could stick to. Why can't we use something like that to give people so that we can help filter it throughout their body? And can you also explain to people what the electrochemical oxidation process means? Because that's kind of a few words that are kind of complicated. Yeah, so the resin technology is new. Um, it's been in Australia a couple of years. There's only one main resin company right now that can pull out the PFAS compounds, and this is a patented resin process. So there's other people trying to develop resins also, but you couldn't necessarily use it for your body because this is like a giant column full of resin just to send water through. So in order to prevent it from getting into your body, you would need to treat the water that you're drinking or the water that you're using to water your crops or things like that. And then electrochemical oxidation is... In the simplest terms, we have an anode and the cathode, so two electrodes, and we're going to apply a current across them, and then we take the PFAS as close as we can to the anode, and we pull out electrons from the molecule, and then we break it down into carbon dioxide and water and free fluoride. Can we use that process, hopefully, to purify the water systems as well, like um, the electrochemical oxidation? Well, technically, you could, but as every technology, electro electrooxidation also has some drawbacks. And one of the challenges that we are currently facing is the generation of byproducts such as perchlorate, for example. So in first place, we have to make sure that we are not really generating that much perchlorate. And then if we are able to do that, I think it will definitely would be a feasible you know solution for drinking water but currently we're treating wastewater so it's not it's not directed for for drinking water so it's basically just to treat water and put it back in the surface yeah. Water. yeah and again the concentrations that you see of PFAS in drinking water are so low that you would need to concentrate them first through a resin before you could use electrochemical oxidation because these have health effects at 70 parts per trillion. And if you think of, like, lead is another common ion, lead is 15 parts per billion. Um, so PFOA and PFOS, 70 parts per trillion, is 215 times lower than the limit of lead. This is assuming an arbitrary volume of liquid, I'm assuming, correct? Yeah, so parts per trillion, parts per billion, these are all in, like, grams per liter. Milligrams per liter would be parts... Per million and then you would go down from there. So are there any other challenges in regards to electrochemical oxidation for this process of remediation of PFAS? So one of the challenges that we do face as well is uh, energy usage. Um, so 
some of these experiments take up um, what would be equivalent to a small town, small town's usage in about a day. Um, so it's a lot of energy that we're uptaking and a lot of energy costs that we're having as well. Um, so one of um, the solutions that we've we've come up with is a combined current density technique. So Mary mentioned earlier that we apply a current to the electrodes. Um, so we equate that to a current density. Um, so, so usually we go from the span of one milliamp per centimeter squared to about 100 um, in our trials. Um, so 100 milliamps per centimeter squared is a lot, a lot of energy. Um, so if you run an experiment for your whole time with this high current density, um, it's going to be a lot of energy that you're uptaking. So um, what we've hypothesized is since these ex these experiments and these molecules follow a typical exponential decay pattern, um, what we do for the first minute, few minutes of our experiment is apply a high current density and for the remainder, um, a lower current density um, so that we're hoping to follow a similar decay pattern no matter what since they all stabilize out. Um, so with one of our experiments we did, we did um, 50 milliamps per centimeter squared for 15 minutes and 5 milliamps per centimeter squared for the remaining 45 minutes. And we saw a 70% decrease in energy uptake with only a 6% increase in remaining concentrations of PFOA at the end. Yeah, I would just like to add that as with any sort of emerging technology, there are a whole different variety of parameters, whether it be pH, supporting electrolyte, or current density that needs to be optimized as we look to continue to scale this thing up so we can handle higher volumes at a time. That's exactly what I was just thinking about, Greg. I was wondering, how are you going to do this with such high volumes if it takes so much energy just for a little bit of area? And then the resin, you were also saying it needs to have a strong uh, concentration, a high concentration of PFAS. So either you need a lot of energy or a lot of PFAS. So where do you think the road is going to take you all? Well, in that sense, electrochemical oxidation shouldn't be considered as a primary treatment option just because of what you mentioned, the energy consumption. So in that sense, uh, we are looking forward to do that, you know, have to use different pretreatment technologies. And then when you just have PFAS at the end, use electrochemical oxidation just to oxidize the PFAS. So we really want to get rid of everything before just because if you have additional compounds there and you want to apply electrochemical oxidation, at the end you're going to be consuming energy, or I would say wasting energy, to oxidize other undesired compounds that we don't really want to oxidize. So that's the reason why we are we need of upper treatment, which in the case of Mary is uh, the steel bottom solution of upper treatment, which is the ion exchange. And in my case, it would be it can be a reverse osmosis, for example, in which we can also concentrate the PFAS that we want, get rid of everything, any organic matter with any other uh, type of um, technology, and then just have the PFAS at the end and oxidize them. Mary, you mentioned that the center that you work for is for coating in diamonds, right? Yes. How are diamonds used in this process in the first place? So all of the electrodes that we use are made of boron dope diamond. Uh, so this is grown in a hot filament system on a metal substrate, and then we use that in the electrochemical oxidation for the electrodes. And what makes diamonds such an attractive dopant? Well, diamond itself isn't considered a dopant. It's like the primary film, and then boron is the dopant of the diamond. So the boron is what adds conductivity so that we're able to pass the current through the electrodes since diamond on its own is an insulator. And then boron dope diamond itself is very, uh, how do I say this? It's very like non-reactive. So you don't have interferences with biological compounds or organics in your solution sticking to your surface or fouling your anode is what we would call it. So it's 
easier to use in that sense, and it also lasts longer because a lot of anodes, such as like a graphite, would corrode really fast in some of these salty solutions, or just a metal would corrode, whereas the borondal diamond has a longer lifetime. Right, so the borondal diamond, or how we call it BDD, is basically an inert material because it doesn't react with organics unlike other other electrodes. So that's that's the primary reason why we would like to use or why we use BDD, because it doesn't react with um, organics, and it's it, it has a very strong oxidant power, like um, the and and also uh, it doesn't generate as much oxygen as other materials. Because what happens is that when you're oxidizing organics, you don't just oxidize the organics; you also have a side reaction, which is the oxygen generation. So you are generating oxygen all the time. And one of the key features that BDD has is that you generate less oxygen, unlike other materials. So that's also an advantage of using BDD. For clarification for people who might not know, what does it mean to dope a material? Well, basically doped means to add a conducting agent which in this case, so diamond naturally is not con- non-conductive. And then when you add boron, you're adding conductivity to it, so it becomes semiconductor. And why are semiconductors attractive for this kind of research? A semiconductor material allows you to pass a current and a voltage through more easily. So since all these experiments are done by applying a current, we want to make sure that we have that material. When I think of semiconducting technology, I often think about uh, the substrate, which is uh, usually something like germanium or silicon. Uh, What advantage does diamond have over those types of materials? The diamond is actually usually grown on a substrate such as silicon. So a lot of sensors would be grown on silicon, but if you have a large enough silicon plate that you grow diamond on, it can be very brittle. Um, So for the wastewater treatment applications, we would actually do it on niobium substrates, which would be a metal, so it's more robust. You just said that you can grow diamonds like, like a plant? Like, how do you grow a diamond? Well, all of our diamond electrodes are fabricated in-house at our Fraunhofer Center. Uh, So basically the process is we have our niobium substrate and we have a really hot temperature, really high temperature, and we flow methane gas and hydrogen gas through the system. And basically the hydrogen gas breaks up the methane into just carbon and hydrogen atoms, and the carbon atoms bond to each other to form the diamond crystals. Uh, This is called our chemical vapor deposition system. Um, And you can only really grow um, a small circular disc in these types of systems. But another system that we do have at the center is a hot filament chemical vapor deposition system. Um, So this is a foot by foot square plate and um, you put your substrate on top of wires. Um, And so these wires, um, you flow a current through the wires and you have a, again, a warm temperature in the chamber. Um, And what it does is it's just a larger surface area and you can get a lot more diamond grown onto the area rather than with your regular chemical vapor deposition. Cool. Normally I think of diamonds being formed through pressure, but what are in these filaments? Is it similar to like what coal has in it? It's just a metal wire, um, so you're running a current through metal wires, um, and that expands your surface area a little better, and it causes um, a little bit more of a spread of your vacuum tendencies rather than in a, just a small little, it's a four inch by four inch area, right? Yeah, so the CVDs, we normally make three millimeter diamonds, so pretty small. Um, And the hot filament, like Emma said, it's a foot by a foot. And when she means like warm temperatures, we're talking like 2,000 degrees Celsius to make these filaments, which are made of tungsten, heat up hot enough to break apart the methane so that you do get this reaction on your substrate surface that deposits the carbon for the diamond to form. 
And this is really nothing like the kind of diamonds that you would see on an engagement ring, for example. These are just very thin films, less than a meter or less than a millimeter thick. We can I, make those diamonds, though. We have before, <laughs> and it's high purity diamond, so it doesn't really have other elements on it besides carbon and hydrogen, and that's why we apply vacuum pressure, vacuum pressure, so we can actually work in a clean environment. Right, and then if we were to dope it for like the electrochemical um, applications, then you would add boron into it. And adding boron actually makes a black diamond. So you have a blackish gray boron dope diamond film as your electrode. Thanks, Mary. And for any of our audience tuning in late, can you quickly remind them why boron doped diamonds are actually really good for using as an anode for separating out the PFAS? Yeah, so boron of diamond as an anode material for PFAS remediation allows us to push higher current densities without corroding away the material, so they have a longer lifetime compared to other anodes. And they're also an inert material, so we don't get this interaction with organics from the solution that could hinder the use of our electrode for PFAS. Thanks for that summary, Mary. Something that I think about throughout this interview is I currently work in a federally funded lab, so it's very academic-based, very fundamental research-based, but Fraunhofer is different. It's more of a corporate lab. What is the experience of working in a lab like that, and how does it differ from an academic lab? Um, So the cool thing about Fraunhofer is um, it's one of the most unique labs um, that I've been introduced to. Um, So there's a lot of people from Germany who come over um, because it is a German research and design uh, organization. Um, So a lot of Germans come over um, to begin as project engineers at our office. Um, There's also a lot of MSU faculty that works um, in our labs as well. So it's kind of bridging the gap between academia and industry. Um, We kind of hit that um, Bermuda Triangle, I would say, of research where we're trying to come up with things that we're not sure is going to work or not, whether, whereas other labs are using um, practices that are tried and true. Yeah, I was going to say we are a nonprofit organization, and like Emma was saying, our business model is where we bridge the gap. That's our buzzword that we love to say, bridge the gap between academia and industry, where it's essentially taking very basic level research and finding new ways to apply it to industry. Or for example, some company will come to us and say, hey, we need a solution to this problem and we'll work with them to help them solve that. Okay. So as Emma and Greg said, uh, Frank Hoffer works in applied research, basically. We don't really work in fundamental research. Uh, The philosophy of Frank Hoffer is to basically bridge the gap between um, academia and industry. So we're doing that. We have a problem, and then we try to uh, do research in applied, well, apply research and solve the problems. But it's very interesting because we all get the chance to work with actually current employees, and the philosophy of research is a little bit different. You know, it's, it's, it's not just about going to the lab and doing experiments. It's about, you know, talking to people uh, having some strategies. And I think that at least for Greg and Emma, it's a great a great experience for their future because they're living another type of experience, you know, in comparison to the average research lab. I'd also like to add that at Fraunhofer, we get the opportunity to work hand-in-hand with some of the customers. So there might be a customer project that comes in and wants an experiment, and I've actually had to sit down and show my experiment to them and what I'm doing And then I also get experience in writing proposals and getting funding. So we see not only the academic research side of things, but we see how you would actually manage a project and how you would get this funding and then what to do with this funding once you have it. So that's a whole other thing, whereas you don't usually experience until you're either in a professor role or you're in industry managing projects. That brings a question to mind. You mentioned funding. How is an industry nonprofit 
research group funded? Like, what kind of places do you apply for funding with? Is it more governmental or are they more grants with like private corporations or could it be anything? We are on average funded 50-50 between government and industry. So we have industry partners that come looking for projects and then the other 50% is with uh, government agencies and things like that. So in order to keep some of our funding from Germany, Fraunhofer has to keep this balance 50-50 between government and industry kind of balancing this academic and application-based role. And where exactly is the Fraunhofer Center located in the Lansing area? We are right on the campus of Michigan State University, but we are south campus, so we are in the engineering research complex right off of Service Road. Oh, so it's it's still a lab on campus, but it operates under a different jurisdiction, if anything. Sort of. Um, the Fraunhofer Center is an MSU Fraunhofer Center, so we are directly tied together. We do most things through MSU. There's only the occasional project that will only be Fraunhofer, not MSU. So there are other locations for Fraunhofer other than the MSU location? Yes, there are nine centers, I believe, in the United States that make up Fraunhofer USA. Each center is located on a different campus or university, and each has its own main topic. So like I said, we're the Center for Diamond Encodings. There's also a center for laser applications, or we have a software center, or a couple different centers in the U.S. That's cool, though. Do you you all ever uh, collaborate with these different uh, centers? Um, We actually just had someone from the center at the University of Maryland come um, last week um, because we're starting to collaborate a project with them. Um, So I think that's super cool that we get to do that. Um, one of our our communications manager gets to go to the different centers and speak with the different members of HR there as well. He gets to go to a bunch of different conferences as well with other employees. This question is for Vanessa and Mary. You both are graduate students here at Michigan State University. Graduate students are paid through different methods, such as research assistantships or teaching assistantships. How are you both paid? Do you have to teach as well? No, we don't have to teach, fortunately. Um, well, the tuition that we receive, basically we're covered by the project itself that we're working with. So uh, we're covered by the city of Grand Rapids, which corresponds to the um, landfill leachate treatment, but also by Amtrak, which is... Yeah, so Amtrak is funding the the project that I'm working on that has the still bottoms that I'm treating from the absorbents. Greg and Emma, since both of you are undergraduates in this laboratory, what has been your experience having two graduate students having uh, to mentor you in these different topics that you're learning throughout this experience? Well, having these two has been great as they're, they've been both been really great mentors along with our boss, Corey Resnick. Uh, when I first joined Fraunhofer, uh, they would, continuously joke at me saying, oh, we'll convince you to end up wanting to go to grad school. And at first I was like, no way, not, not going to happen. And now I think that my passion for research that I've gotten from this group has made me actually want to continue to pursue my education in graduate school. Um, another thing that I wanted to also mention is for me too, um, a lot of the kids, there's a lot of undergraduates that work there as well. So we get to meet people across different types of majors. Um, I'm the only environmental engineering student in my lab, but we have a lot of chemical engineers, material science engineers, uh, electrical engineers, and mechanical engineers, so not people you would normally see in a classroom and not the type of work that you would even be experience, experiencing in a classroom as well. And it's pretty fun to say to my friends that I get to work with diamonds all the time. So <laughs> many, a lot of people think that's pretty neat. Yeah. And Mary and Vane, what has been your experience having the opportunity to mentee these students. Right. Well, I consider that um, working with Emma and Greg is really fundamental for us because they help us a lot. You know, working with wastewater treatment remediation is not about just running the experiments and, you know, you need to do a couple of things in order to get uh, the results. And sometimes, you know, the procedures that you have to apply are quite long and then you need to analyze the results and go through it and 
it can take you a day. So I think uh, or more for each each test. So in summer, I think that um, we really could not work without them. And I think that it's been working very good. Uh, it's a great team. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that they all are here. I can add that although they do a lot of work for us, which really benefits us and helps us out, we try to also help them out a little bit. So I'll I have Greg as an author on one publication so far, and I have another publication in the works that I need to talk to Emma about so that Emma can get on a publication. So it's a pretty good balance between the four of us of helping each other get this work done, making a difference, but also benefiting academically and also professionally for the future for all of us. Is there anything that you learned from Greg and Emma as you've gone through this experience? They definitely keep me young, which I appreciate. <laughs> well, in my case, they remind me how I was when I was young. <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm not young, but when I was young. No, but <laughs> I've learned a lot from mentoring them, a lot about myself and how I need to mentor other people that might uh, learn in a different manner than I do, or they don't learn as visual, or they learn more visual and not as read and write. Um and I've learned better communication skills, I'd say, between helping them and actually learning what I know enough to be able to tell them and what I don't know enough myself to be able to help them with. Right. And I think it's it's also very important to me uh, because sometimes, you know, you can know or read different things in literature, but then the complicated part comes when you have to explain it to someone else and then or where you want to communicate it to someone or want to give instructions about something so you really need to be clear and sometimes you know it gets difficult but you know when we do that every day with Emma and Greg I think that I have gotten better or kind of better in that so <laughs> yeah this is really cool how could someone who's interested in maybe volunteering or working in your laboratory of Fran Hoffer join or find out more information so Fran Hoffer will post openings on Handshake through MSU. So if you're an MSU student and you're interested in working at Fraunhofer, you can always check Handshake for the listings. Um, and those are listings everywhere from our electrochemistry group, our 3D printing group, our diamond growing group, and our physical vapor deposition group, such as like tool coding. So every time we have an opening, it's posted on Handshake or on a job board. Um, another thing is if there's any students or if there's any high school students listening to this um if you are accepted into the professorial assistantship program you can opt to um say you are interested in working in Fraunhofer because they pair you with whatever type of research you are interested in um so that's another way that you could be able to start working at a at a as a freshman and i think it's also important um, that Greg and Emma mentioned their personal experience because they started working at Frankhofer from the very beginning since you were mm -hmm. a freshman, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, as honors college students, Emma and I were both selected to be professorial assistants, which essentially an incoming freshman gets paired with a professor, or in our case, it's a little bit different at Fraunhofer. But getting put into that position uh, really helped us uh, with our future with research and really gave us a great many opportunities to get our hands in some different, many different kinds of research. I think it also helped us with our transition into college because we were learning something we're not learning in the classroom. And I think that application and research at such an early, an early time point in our college careers really helped us be successful in our classes as well. Well, speaking of classes, how are you able to actually do the research in this laboratory before actually learning about the different concepts? Our boss is really, um, he's an awesome mentor. Um, he's taught us so much, and he sits down with us and makes sure we understand the concepts before we're applying them. So, Yeah, I mean, other than that, it's just kind of getting your hands on and learning as you go and reading a lot of literature. Yeah, a lot, a lot of literature. Well, thank you so much to all four of you for joining us today in this incredible interview. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. And remember, the truth is in the science. If you're a current or visiting undergraduate student that would like to be interviewed with your graduate student mentor, please reach out to us at scifiles at impact89fm.org. See you next week on The Sci-Files.